Thanks, Morak. Uh, I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, so I'm going to talk today to a, uh, a University of Glasgow project related to the sharing of practitioner inquiries uh, amongst ITE students. Um, in terms of the project itself, um, I want to start by saying a few words about what the intent was. Um, so the University of Glasgow project uh, explored what benefits can be derived from student teachers sharing and crucially discussing, uh, you know, in line with the theme of creating professional space, uh, discussing practitioner inquiries that are focused on aspects of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, so literacy, numeracy and health and well-being, uh, health and well-being for, for the educationally disadvantaged. Um, that's the, that's the, the broad overarching focus. In terms of the, the specifics of the of, of the study, um, we uh, asked for volunteers uh, from uh, the MED Duke program. Now, I think that the, the nature of the MED Duke program war warrants pausing over just, just briefly, because um, it is quite a distinctive program um, and the structure of it may prove relevant um, in relation to some of the findings that, we're, that we'll see later on. So MED Duke is a, is a five-year integrated masters ITE program. Um, so don't be deceived by, by, by the reference to M level. It is, a, it, it is a, an ITE programme uh, for the preparation of, of, of teachers into, in, into, in, into primary schooling. Um, they start at academic level seven, so standard undergraduate entry, and they study for five continuous years, uh, completing a full master's at the end, a full master's dissertation at the end. Um, that's relevant for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we chose this cohort because they were in a particularly good place in relation to practitioner inquiry because of the, of, of, of the five year full master's pathway. Um, and it's also particularly relevant because it was in part uh, a COVID measure. Now these students complete their, uh, their, their teaching qualification at the end of year four. In other words, they weren't subject to uh, the various complications around placement uh, that, that the ITE sector has experienced uh, in this academic session. Um, so they were able to focus uh, uh, much more fully on their practitioner inquiries. So we, we asked for volunteers for, from the MED Duke cohort, the fifth year MED Duke cohort, uh, and, and those volunteers formed focus groups uh, discussing both their own live practitioner inquiries um, and those of previous cohorts uh, related to various aspects of Scottish Attainment Challenge, a mixture of empirical and desk-based studies um, and I'll go into a wee bit more detail on that in due course. Uh, the focus group data were subject to a standard inductive thematic analysis and those uh, criteria for trustworthiness. So in terms of what those themes were, uh, there were six, uh, um, as you can see here. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna work through each of these in turn um, and, and, and share uh, what, 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 what came through in relation to each of these. Um, so, there's inquiry of stance, differing research methodologies, criticality, sharing inquiries effectively, transferability, uh, and the relevance of context or context matters. So, in respect to, to inquiry of stance, now this is this is uh, obviously a phrase of, of, of Cochrane Smith and, and Little uh, from 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 ninety nine. Um, well, I think that if, if there was one key finding from from the entire project, it would be this, which is namely that. Uh, through the process of sharing and discussing practitioner inquiries with one another related to aspects of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, students felt a really deepened sense of, of, of inquiry as a pedagogical stance, both generally, uh, but also specifically in terms of how they might use inquiry as a means of, of supporting the most disadvantaged. Um, now, if you, if you see some of, the, some of the quotations that you can see there, you can see in relation to supporting a community of teachers. Um, you can see the, the reference to, to finding your own academic voice and your own academic journey. Um, there are different things that I could say about that, but, uh, but conscious of time, I think the thing I'd really want to draw attention to uh, is the idea of, 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 of these student teachers developing their sense of identity as teacher researchers. Or, or as or as or as uh, or as practitioner researchers or whatever terminology we want to use, uh, but that sense of of, of 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 autonomy and empowerment that's derived from from being a teacher researcher, um, and they were very clear uh, these focus groups on on the associated benefits that they felt uh, disadvantaged learners could derive uh, from, uh, from 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 having teachers who were empowered 
uh, and autonomous uh, and inquiring, if you like. Um, so that I think is 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 is, is, the, is one of the most important themes to report on. Um, but there are some others which I, which I'd like to draw attention to as well. Um, so, I don't know. Differing research methodologies uh, is, is something that, that I think could be a point of interest uh, for colleagues. One of the things that we were wondering about before we uh, initiated this intervention with, with ITE students was the extent to which they would be responsive to practitioner inquiries where, where very different research methodologies were in operation. Um, so for example, the, 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 the cohort in question uh, undertook principally desk-based inquiries they weren't able to undertake empirical work out in the practicum. Um, and, we, and we were curious about the extent to which that might influence their perceptions of the nature of, of educational research, the nature of inquiry. We were curious about the extent to which they would be able to uh, appreciate or analyze or engage with uh, more empirical studies. Um, and what was lovely actually was that, was that the student teachers seemed to exhibit that, 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 they, could ex that they could engage with a whole range of different studies. Um, you can see references there to, to more quantitative work, references to participant observation. Um, and they were interested in, in the empirical work, but also the contrast um, with, with, with things like a desk-based rapid evidence review. Um, one of the lovely things actually that came through from it was not just though their interest in other, in other research methodologies, but their appreciation of the rapid evidence review or desk-based study in general as a, as a form of practitioner inquiry. You know, I think we often think about practitioner inquiry as, as classroom-based action, action research, but I think they actually derived real insight from, from more desk-based approaches as well, though not to the exclusion of empirical work. Um, another really interesting thing was around criticality. Again, before we conducted the intervention, one of the things that we were interested in was the extent to which uh, they would just agree with each other, if you know what I mean. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what, what proved really interesting was the extent to which they, they, they were robust and rigorous in their engagement with, with one another's work, with one another's inquiries. Uh, you, can, you can see some examples there of, uh, of, of identifying uh, contradictory, uh, contradictory findings. Um, there, was some, some, there was some lovely engagement with the quantitative element, actually, which was, which was, which was particularly pleasing, um, and, and discussion about paradigms, but in a critical sense as well. Um, now, I think it's worth bearing in mind that, that, that we are talking about students in the fifth year of study here on an integrated master's pathway. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I, think, I think it is worth emphasising that, that students were able to engage with practitioner inquiries related to educational disadvantage, but to do so in a really critically minded way, um, rather than it simply being sort of echo chamber type stuff. Um, the fourth thing that we that we identified was was in terms of how we might go about sharing inquiries in effectively. Um, so, for example, at the outset at the outset of the intervention, one of the things that we were interested in, and we are still interested in it, but we've we've, we've become a bit more cautious of it on the basis of these findings, is is the extent to which we might be able to create sort of online repositories, whereby students could access uh, each other's inquiries in a free way. Um, and we, th we still think that that is of interest. But um, one thing that was very, very clear from, from the focus groups was the extent to which students appreciated discussion and debate in a shared professional space. So it's not just about them being able to access the work or having the practitioner inquiries available to them. It's, it's, it's facilitating that discussion uh, and having, that, and having that, 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 that environment in which it can take place. Uh, so you can see some quotations to that effect. Although it is worth noting as well that we're not talking about sort of um, uh, students were keen to emphasize, hence the, the other three quotes there, that, it, that it's not just about free discussion, that they, they, did, they did appreciate as ITE students, as beginning teachers, some structure. Um, and that was partly to do with um, the, the, the structure of the dissertations themselves and how, and how they felt dissertation assessment design could be altered to make, uh, to make them more accessible. Um, to, 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 to audiences other than the academic marking them, if you like. Um, but also it was around uh, the extent to which uh, discussions should be structured. Um, so we had some prompt questions for the focus groups. There was lots of free discussion as well, but they did appreciate prompt, uh, prompt questions too. Um, now, the, the, the fifth thing that I wanted to speak to is, is the idea of transferability. 
Um, I think this is particularly interesting because it's about the, the extent to which um, uh, interventions are transferable from, 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 one, uh, from one context to the next. Um, now, this, this was a really intriguing aspect because on, on the one hand, the students did report that they felt that specific interventions, let's say the, the in practitioner inquiry A, uh, could this then be trans transferred to context B, C, D? Uh, they did feel that there, would, that there was some transferability of specific uh, strategies or, or interventions. Um, but I think it is worth strongly emphasizing the extent to which they felt that that was, uh, for example, if you look at the two middle quotes, um, notice that the second quote uses the word translatable, not, not transferable. Notice that the, the, the third quote refers to the teacher interpreting uh, the, the, the dissertation and then transferring it to their own practice. So it's not as if we were talking about a direct sort of uh, lift and drop uh, kind, kind of exercise. And I think one of the reasons they were keen to emphasize that, that yes, things were transferable across inquiries, but there, was com there were complications was because of the relevance of context, which came through strongly as the, as the sixth and final thing. Um, the, the, this, the, the context ma mattering in, in various different ways. The policy context of an individual country, as you can see from the first quote, uh, the school environment itself and the extent to which that would affect the transferability uh, of given interventions for disadvantaged learners um, and also the, the specific needs of individual pupils. They were very, very keen uh, students to emphasize the extent to which practitioner inquiries were valuable, but they were only valuable insofar as they were relevant to the particular needs of, 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 of individual children. Um, so very much sort of being tailored in, 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 in that specific sense. So those were the, those were the six themes uh, identified from the focus groups, um, and so in terms of in terms of future directions, I think that there are that there, there are sort of uh, two bigger ones and, and one and one and one smaller thing. Um, the first is that it seems like that basic principle of creating a professional space for sharing practitioner inquiries related specifically to educational disadvantage is a sound one and the ITE students appreciate, although I would add again that caveat that we're talking about students at the end of a five-year process, a fully integrated master's, and I think that that is relevant. Um, but the, the basic principle seems to be sound, creating professional space for these discussions. Um, inquiry stance would be the other really major thing. Now, I've already want, talked about that at some length, but I just want to iterate, reiterate, sorry, that um, the inquiry stance was a really important thing for participants. And then as just as a, as a final mi more minor point, um, it was interesting the extent to which the students appreciated desk-based inquiry as a, as a legitimate means of, of, of practitioner research, um, not simply because of COVID's own terms uh, and the insights that they could derive from that. Um, so that was the Glasgow project. I'll stop share there. That was great. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm quite sure you've given quite a lot of food for thought there. Um, absolutely addressing the question of creating professional space and those links between theory, policy and experience for a very specific group of, of student teachers, as you said. We're going to move now to the Sterling Project, who were working with experienced practitioners and I'll ask Nicola to share the screen and John and Alison, I think are going to lead the presentation, but I'm delighted we have Rasheen with us as well. So over to you yourselves. Thanks Maura again, thanks uh, to, to Kevin for his, his presentation. Uh, during, during Kevin's presentation, uh, unfortunately my internet was somewhat dodgy, so uh, hopefully Alison or Rosh will, uh, uh, take over if I suddenly freeze or if I go off script too far. Um, so um, uh, the Sterling Project, we called it um, uh, making a positive difference. Um, and we were asked to distill the project into 20 words, which was slightly difficult. But what we came up with was uh, fostering critical educational spaces as, whoops. Sorry, could we go back, uh, Nicola, sorry, to the previous Thanks. Um, uh, fostering critical educational spaces as catalysts for translating equity, policy and theory, so as to transform communities of practice. So um, hopefully the, what we say coming up 
um, we'll, we'll unpack that. Um, but um, okay, uh, Nicola, if you could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks. So um, our point of departure uh, for, for the project was basically um, some previous work we had done, which indicated that uh, a number of things. Um, the first was that beginning teachers tend to struggle with putting theory into practice. Uh, what we found was that they, they often uh, rely on strategy, uh, but when the strategy fails, they're left somewhat high and dry. So uh, the work of translation, which uh, Kevin was talking about in terms of taking ideas and creating them into specific events, which people participate in, uh, was, was a key one. Secondly, the quality of the mentoring support uh, which beginning teachers experience was highly variable. But we also found that university spaces uh, used constructively uh, could provide scope for both support and encouragement to engage with these sorts of issues and looking at how theory might connect with practice and, and uh, encourage people in, in that uh, difficult work. So uh, having had those previous projects. We, we therefore thought we'd uh, continue with this project uh, and take an oblique angle in relation to the attainment challenge. And rather than working directly with individual young people, uh, uh, rather like the Glasgow project, we would work with um, uh, teachers. Um, and um, we wanted to work with experienced teachers who were mentors in their schools uh, so as to create an opportunity for new resources for thinking and practicing in relation to equity. So our key thing was equity, promoting equity was the course which we devised. And the idea was that they would uh, gain confidence to support beginning colleagues uh, and other colleagues as well in negotiating equity uh, as an educational challenge. So, so that was the, the line that we uh, took. Next slide, please. Thanks. So um, we worked with the uh, teachers at uh, master's level. Um, and so they'd already been in practice for several years and then come back into university as, as a standard master's level courses. Um, and without exception, I think it'd be fair to say that the teachers worked in communities of practice which were in challenging contexts. And our aim was to try and create a, a critical space in relation to thinking about equity, so as to challenge, interrupt and question normal ways of going on um, in order to open up new questions, to develop new knowledge and confidence, so as uh, there might be a creative reframing and innovation in their practice. Uh, we also hoped in the second part of the uh, course that they would themselves work with mentees so as to actually carry out a, uh, an intervention, so as to have some experience of supporting mentees uh, in, the, in that work themselves, of changing their practice so as to be uh, more open to new ways of connecting with children who perhaps present differently from what the uh, what might be expected from their, their previous experience. So, um, and the aim too was to, via this means, was to try and have uh, a knock-on effect on different communities of practice within the schools, uh, beyond the mentee-mentor uh, relationship. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So these were the cohorts that um, we uh, had. Um, as you can see, there, there were two separate promoting equity uh, cohorts. And then on the second year, they move on to the coaching and mentoring uh, course. And that also drew in people from uh, a broader range of pathways within the master's program as well. So um, uh, the promoting equity and the revised coaching and mentoring course um, continues as uh, a pathway uh, uh, available. So, so the, the, these were courses which were devised as a result of the, uh, the research intervention. Thank you. 
And one of the things which we were concerned to do was to think about equity as an educational matter of concern. Um, one of the reasons for this was because um, we were aware that many of the teachers we worked with, um, in Judith Sachs's terms, they were extended professionals. They, were, they, they certainly had a, an understanding of education well beyond that of a particular subject uh, identity or a particular sector, you know, the, the year group in primary, for example. Um, but the trouble was perhaps that uh, the, the limits of their felt responsibility uh, were vast. And uh, to, to the extent that some felt overwhelmed by their responsibility to the young people in their care and in their classes. So um, part of it, in terms of thinking critically about equity is to think about what are the limits of an, an educational approach? What properly belongs to uh, politics or economics in terms of the uh, broader structural issues? But it, one, where uh, is the teacher's responsibility? And so part of what we were trying to do is to actually tease out what an educational response to equity consists in. Um, and uh, in previous work, which Alison and I have, have done, we, we've argued that for something to be educational, um, uh, it consists in, in the interplay of three elements. The first is the critical element, uh, take, taking a, a critical stance in relation to uh, ideas, our practice uh, and re reflexivity. The second is an ethical uh, dimension or element which looks at uh, responsibility, the work we do on ourselves in order to become more responsive, and more attentive to others. And then the third thing is that uh, aspect of translating things into practice, the experimental element, where without its material connection with events and lived realities, ideas sort of hover above actual practice. And so that work of translation that uh, Kevin was talking about is fundamentally tied up with that experimental element, which we see as also vital to a, a dynamic and innovative sense of education. So if you buy that uh, idea, what are the implications for uh, equity? Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So the, the, uh, one of the unexpected things we found from uh, doing the course and thinking critically about uh, education was that it actually led to a critique of the language and discourses of equity, uh, much more so than, than we initially had thought. And um, we've Obviously, it's, it's, it's kind of simplified insofar as it's just a, a versus B kind of format. But, but basically, um, if you take a critical approach to thinking about equity, we might want to look at, um, for example, the metaphor of the gap uh, as, as a, a key uh, way of framing it. Um, uh, and the closure of a gap at that, because you know, so often, so much of the policy discourse is about closing gaps that it, we tend to forget that actually gaps might actually be quite a good thing. They might be quite useful for thinking about difference, for example. Uh, if you uh, approach cultural difference, for example, from the point, point of view of the other, the other side of the gap, it can be a way of actually seeing things from a different perspective, a different point of view. So you, one wouldn't necessarily want to close that gap. Um, equally, in relation to young people, we rather than closing difference, we want, maybe want to actually listen to that difference and acknowledge it. So, so the understanding of meta, the metaphor which uh, is, tends to be used can be problematic. Um, it also creates a sense that we already know what needs to be done. So it's a discourse of mastery, if you like, um, that uh, what we need to do is to close this gap if we're going to make progress. It leads to a kind of literalistic approach uh, in terms of language, um, which is also reductionistic, um, particularly in its focus on uh, socioeconomic 
um, attainment. So, so as we began to look critically at some of these issues, we then moved to thinking about equity in, in a different, more expansive sense, which drew upon a plurality of different languages, interdisciplinary conversations, and the questioning precisely of those metaphors to open up other modes of thinking and other uh, figurations. So as to ask, what are the, what are the consequences of the metaphors we use? Um, how are translations actually worked out here? Picking up on Kevin's point, that it's, it's the transformations, it's the, the importance of context in his sixth um, slide. And, and um, also, which comes with that, and of course is the counterpoint to the mastery discourse, it's, it's acknowledging unknowings in practice. The fact that we you know, have to practice and yet so much is unknown about what, what we're doing. So how, how do we equip and provide support to people working in these, with, with this broader sense of language, a broader sense of their own uh, unknowings in practice? Uh, next slide, please. And one of the things which we seem to us really important is this, this notion of the university as a, a, as a, a, a separate yet connected critical space. Uh, one of the things that many of the uh, uh, practitioners from schools told us was that uh, in the day-to-day -day business of school, it's so difficult to actually get the space with which to have the kind of conversations that we've been talking about, uh, because it's constantly being uh, chipped away with other pressing issues and uh, matters of concern. And so the, the, the possibility of moving away from that uh, that busyness and the, the vibrancy of a school environment to a, a different kind of dynamic environment where they can share with colleagues um, and, and, and tutors uh, ideas and different ways of framing it. Uh, it seems to us to be uh, a, a key part of uh, a, a, a way forward. Uh, next slide, please. And then, uh, so having looked briefly at the critical element, the ethical element um, is part of which uh, one of the topics we looked at was the uh, repurposing of existing tools that, that, that uh, practitioners have. Uh, and, and part of that is looking at, well, how do we assemble this thing called learning? Um, and very often, um, uh, Teachers, when they're inducted into the, uh, the, the craft of teaching, uh, take on forms of lesson planning, which are at root behaviorist. Um, that they're, they're teacher centric in so far as they're, they're designed around specific uh, knowledge outcomes. And, uh, and if a teacher then takes on a more rights informed or equity approach, it tends to be grafted onto that pre-existing uh, uh, approach. So, what is the what might the implications be of moving beyond that kind of teacher centric framing? I, I remember when I began teaching myself in the early nineties, uh, Brown and McIntyre's uh, work, uh, making making sense of teaching, was uh, the order of the day, and their, their notion of normal desirable state. Well, it was the teacher's normal desirable state which was uh, at issue, and the teacher took actions to restore things to what he or she thought was a, a desirable state in the classroom. Well, perhaps an equity inflection refocuses that and it's the normal desirable state of the young people perhaps, or and particularly young people at that. So how can we repurpose uh, some of the ways in which we've been inducted into teaching, actually uh, attend to the collectivity in front of us rather than uh, the, the, the giving priority to, to one person's uh, sense. Um, okay, and then looking at, again, metaphors again, this is a recurrent theme. And, and of course, one of the common ways in which beginning teachers are asked to, to look at differentiation is through the notion of scaffolding. Um, uh, Bruners and Vygotsky's kind of derivations of that. And uh, but of course, scaffolding, implies that you already know the outcome of the building, um, unless it's an unusual kind of scaffolding. But the um, basically, it presupposes one knows 
what it is one has to scaffold. And so one of the things we explored was whether perhaps nautical metaphors of being at sea, um, Leibniz once talked about uh, being cast out at sea from away from the harbour and uh, having to deal with the, the elements, the forces, the wind and the sea. And uh, if you're captaining a boat, then it's a, a different kind of uh, negotiation that is needed, one which is constantly attentive to moves and changes of direction as one plots a course uh, through all that. So maybe that acknowledges contingencies better. So that was just one example, but more generally, we, we explored a much broader range of literary tropes and figurations, um, which might enhance practice, uh, drawing on novels and so forth, to actually look at how we might move beyond the existing discourse to a broader understanding. Uh, next slide, please. And then the experimental element, uh, is those opportunities to try out things in relation to equity. Now that can include what uh, Karen was describing in terms of uh, desk work, certainly. Uh, and some of the uh, teachers in, in our cohort also critically evaluated some of their existing uh, in equity interventions uh, to look at in the light of their new understandings, what they would do perhaps differently. But it was also working with the mentor or mentee to explore uh, some of those issues which they've encountered in translating theory into their own setting, uh, of drawing on a, a broader language to open up things uh, and acknowledging those unknowings in practice uh, and uh, not, not writing those out uh, and providing different kinds of support to practitioners in those very negotiations. So, those, that seemed to us the uh, experimental aspect of taking equity seriously. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the evidence we've got, which uh, Roche did extensive interviews with the practitioners, and the uh, evidence is it not, not only has it impacted the mentor-mentee relationships, but also there's been wider conversations within the different communities of practice that people have been involved in so as to extend the conversations further. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as Morag said at the beginning, we've, we've uh, concocted a few questions which might be uh, of interest, but don't, please don't feel in any way constrained by these. Uh, I'm sure you've got better ones, but the, fir the first one was, um, uh, how is equity to be understood? Uh, what kind of languages, disciplines, and scope might that encompass? Secondly, in promoting equity, are we engaging in some form of social engineering? Or is this a more open-ended educational project? Thirdly, what are the conditions necessary for making critical educational spaces? Spaces are separate from and yet related to everyday organizational structures? And is mentoring vital for translations to be educational? And finally, if so, what are the implications of that? And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to Nicola for moving the slides on. Thank you comment. very much. Um, a lot of questions there um, and I'm sure some ideas that um, people will would like to um, come come back to uh, and make some points, ask some questions. The debate is open to yourself. Stephen, do you want to come in first? Yeah, I was wondering about the point on transferability and I was thinking about the work that I've been doing myself for the, this project and asking some questions around about the idea of resonance as opposed to transferability. You know, thinking about it more in terms of how do, how do teachers view what they're reading? How does it resonate with them? How do they then think about that? It's about, I think, 
effect, effectively we're talking about this idea of how we translate all of this so that it makes sense to your context before you then take it forward. So resonance and comparability before transferability, I think, might be something to think about. But I would also acknowledge that there's a whole set of unknowns. And the concept of unknowing is quite an interesting one, which relates to what Johnny's uh, work was talking about. Because I think it's one of the things that as part of reflective practice that we don't acknowledge the unknowns. And often when we go into any situation, whether it's practitioner inquiry or just a bog standard critical incident in the classroom, there are often more unknowns than knowns. And it's how we negotiate that. And it's about that, how do we get to a point where we can acknowledge that without you know, almost being unstuck by it. That's some great points there. Um, the, the challenge of the recognising the unknowns and how to work with them, particularly when in, in these projects, the majority of the research was, was actually carried out with, with students. Um, as Kevin's was. Um, John, do you want to come back in about resonance and comparability? No. <laughs> well, I wonder if I could just briefly speak to, mm. to, to, to the other point around, um, around unknowing, because that, that, that's, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, similarly, that's 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 the thing I particularly like about this about the Sterling project that, that that phrase on that notion, and for me, it connects to what we've been doing at Glasgow because of, of, of the idea of inquiry as stance, which obviously isn't ours. You know, it comes from Marilyn Cochran Smith and so on. But um, but that notion of of inquiry as as a, as a disposition and being comfortable with not knowing things and and and, uh, and having a provisional sense of, of of knowledge, if you like, I think is is uh, is something that we seem to have, have found to be. A real benefit in terms of in terms of what we were doing. So there's there's, there's a definite point of connection there. Alison, yes, sorry. I think maybe John's got um, uh, <clears throat> strangled by the the IT situation. I just would like to respond to, to Stephen's comment um, because I think I think that was that was definitely something that I, that that we kind of um, drew particularly out of. Um, the work that we did with the student, the master's students in relation to literature so that we used quite a lot of material that was not purely academic and I think um, yeah I think the word uh, resonance is really kind of helpful to explain some of the things that happened that they were then able to um, see an issue in a very different set of circumstances. So, so actually kind of expanding the, 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 the kinds of discourses with which we engaged was actually very, very helpful in then, then being able to understand what they were trying to do. So I think it's a good word. Thank you, Alison. Mark. It's, it's what I thank Stephen for bringing in unknowing since I'm, I'm doing my AD thesis all around uh, agnotology, the production of ignorance. And uh, I'm very, very interested, especially as I'm a CLD practitioner, so I don't fit kind of quite into the teacher, or what, what is the teacher mould. But, uh, but the idea of knowing is often very central <laughs> to the idea of, of teaching uh, and therefore to to get practitioners to be in a space where they are comfortable not knowing. For me, it's, it's, it's just a massively important, really, really crucial issue because I, I think it also is transformative in terms of the relationship with the, you know, the learner. Because if you're there validating not knowing <laughs> uh, and, and creating a space where it's okay not to know, um, then that for me is, is really excellent practice because you're starting to create a, a, not a dependence, but a, a mutually supportive relationship in terms of finding what we can know but also how do we, and I think for me, I, I was come out of a, a, a meeting this afternoon with Education Scotland around COP26 and climate change and all that kind of thing. And I feel that we, the education system is not 
really understanding this existential crisis. It's maybe even starting to talk about it now, but it, it's, it's really difficult to get your head around. But for me, one of the first things is to, is to really embrace this idea of, no, of the uncertainty. Uh, I, and the fact that, we, that by clinging on to the, what we think is certain, it's, it, it prohibits us and, uh, and delays our ability to change and transform in the way that I think is, 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 is absolutely crucial. So thank you very much, Stephen, for bringing, bringing that in. But, but all, I mean, I found the, the, the presentations fascinating. But, you know, for me, everything leads back to what are we doing around this cl climate emergency, the, the, the biodiversity emergency. So I think for us to really respond to that, we have to make it much more central to our thinking. Thanks, right. Mark. Rasheen, you have your hand up. from that actually I just wanted to um, add on the you can't hear me very well yeah oh sorry I, is that better yeah that's much better sorry. thanks <laughs> my connection's a bit funny today um just uh, on the theme of unknowing I just wanted to to kind of mention as well that this came out quite strongly in my interviews with members of staff with the members of the, of the cohort the actual their experiences in the classroom and, and some of what came out of the course and the learning for them was thinking about their position and their interrelationship with the with the learners, and also with with parents as well, and with families, and they spoke quite a lot about that sense of unknowing, and of the importance of feeling comfortable as a teacher in saying I don't know, and in having that with your with your learners and learning with them, and finding creative ways to learn with them alongside them, as opposed to just seeing yourself as standing at the front and imparting knowledge. Um, but also they did flag up the importance um, of raising that with families um, um, as well. And so several of them mentioned that they'd spoken to parents and families about the fact they were doing this master's course. And they found actually that being open with families about the fact that they were still learning about their practice was really, really valuable and actually uh, really opened up a different space in interactions with parents. Um, that they were open to, to learning and to new ideas and to always wanting to improve their practice. Uh, so I just wanted to flag that up because I think that, that that theme of unknowing was really raised by them as very important in their practice and something that they were coming to more and more. I hope you could hear me. <laughs> we could, that, that was very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, and an important contribution to, to the debate. Um, there's a... An, uh, an important point from Angela in the in the chat about embracing uncertainty, and um, the reflecting on you know what we've experienced over this last year. Um, I, yes, there are a number of challenges there about um, thinking about about how we create the spaces and where those critical spaces are. The question, one of the questions that that Kevin asked, uh, where the spaces are, where um, either practicing teachers or student teachers uh, have the opportunity to gain that confidence to work with the unknown and the unknowings. Um, challenge across either initial or continuing teacher education, I think. Paul. Um, I have a comment that I think um, both John and, and Kevin would be able to, to, to comment on, indeed anybody who's been involved with the project. <clears throat> so for the past seven years I've been supervising the BA4 projects and every single year they do a project and it has to be in the class in their final placement and it has to be something with their class. And, and I'll be absolutely blunt, they varied in, in, in quality from being exceptional to being pretty bloody awful to be perfectly honest with you. And one of the problems I found it's it's not to do with ability or anything like that. it's to do with they get so hung, the students get so hung up on I've got to show something or prove something and, and, and I've got to actually at the end of this got to have something tangible now this year they've not been able to do that and they've had to do desk-based work and they've had to do something so which is literature focused um, which is music to my ears as many of you will know so and I found that, now it might just be that I had four very good students this year but the quality of work was just outstanding I, I mean it was just fundamentally streets ahead of anything I'd seen before. And I've spoken to one or two colleagues in the School of Education, and they're sort of saying the same thing. And, and, the, and the students are saying things like, at the beginning, well, I want to do this, and I want to show that, and I said, oh, you let them run with that. And then after a while, they come back and they say, well, 
I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm just, I'm getting so many conflicting messages. I'm getting things all over the place. I'm getting literature that says this, ideas that say that, theory says this, theory says that. And it's as if a kind of light bulb went off in their mind that they realise this, this isn't just about plan the lesson, deliver it, assess and beha manage behaviour. It's much more than that. And they actually ended up in... In, in, in really high quality conversations, most of these the, the, the students I had were doing stuff on the equity gap or teacher burnout or this sort of stuff. Um, so doing stuff with COVID-19, obviously, we're doing stuff on that as well. Um, so I wonder whether actually the drive we have, um, and I think we're all guilty of this as well, and I think education in general is guilty of this, the drive we have to say, if you're not doing something that's related to what you're doing in the school, directly with kids or whatever, then it, it's of limited worth. Thereby, we ignore theory, we ignore literature, we ignore conceptualization, I think, in some cases. <clears throat> and we all know those of us that do theoretical work, you know, there's limited funding for that as well, which is kind of a knock on into the university. But I wonder also, and, and John and Kevin, specifically for you, I think, is that most of what I've heard of the, the, the um, attainment project up to date, I think it's been brilliant stuff going on, but most of what I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, has been, with teachers or student teachers who are doing a course, doing something that is credentialized. And I'm wondering, you know, we're, we're working with student teachers, they have to get a qualification in order to teach, therefore they have to engage with this stuff, otherwise they don't pass. We're working with teachers engaging with master's courses who want to do master's courses, who want to be engaged with this. How can we shift the narrative from working with those who want to do this kind of work be it credentialized or not, and usually they want to do it because it's credentialized, to actually all teachers wanting to do it and work in that particular way. Now, if I had the answer to that, I'd be a millionaire and I'd be writing books on it, certainly. But it, it's, a, it's, it's a real problem I have, is that we seem to get caught with the ones who want to do it as part of a study. And there's a whole great swathe of teachers for whom I'm wondering, what are we doing for them? How do we meet them? How do, how do we engage them with this? I, I just don't know, to be honest with you. I think that's a very large question. Kevin, do you want to come? <laughs> um, I, I, I was uh, hoping to come in on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the first element of things around, around desk-based studies. I mean, one thing, one thing I would say in terms of sort of um, COVID silver linings, if you like, is the extent to which um, we, would, uh, we would be looking to see uh, more desk-based approaches as, as being of real relevance to teachers, you know? Um, of, 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 not just because of their, their intrinsic worth, but their relevance to the, to, to, to the practice of those teachers as well. Um, not conceived of as, a, as, an, as an either or, or you know, the, the desk based, you're either an adherent of desk based or you're, or you're an adherent of empirical, but, 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 but merely that desk based is a, is a very legitimate form of inquiry that is of relevance to teachers. Um, so I would, I would strongly agree with that element of, of, of what was said. Thanks, Kevin. John's actually, um, I suspect due to IT issues, come in with a question. One of the bigger questions, just in the, for the last five minutes here, what do people think about the responsibility of teachers to be involved in education as opposed to social engineering? I don't think we can answer that in five minutes, John. <laughs> Stephen, off you go. I think, I think that comes back to the purpose of education and a, a much wider political discussion around about what do the politicians actually think schools in particular, education in general, can and should be able to do, which speaks to the point about limits and what are the limits of what is educationally possible and what is sociologically or economically possible. And I, th I think... I think part of the problem we've got is that they're so fixated on getting quick wins so they can get votes, not actually understanding that education and schooling is a 15, 20 year project, not a five year project. And that's part of the issue. They're always thinking in terms of what would win votes rather than what would actually work for children. <laughs> they say that the child is at the center, but I have my doubts. Possibly data is at the center, uh, definitely anything that will actually say that their policies are working. Um, let's not forget that the, the current incumbent of, of the First Minister's chair 
stated quite clearly, judge my government on how I close the attainment gap, and she hasn't done it yet. But they still re-elected her, and that's the problem, because people are not looking at education as a long-term project. They're looking at it as a five-year short-term fix, and that's that's probably the wrong way to do it. But there's also actually the complexity there of how society has worked with schools. Um, historically, going back to the way schools were used initially for the provision of, of meals and then the development of medical supports and, and vaccinations, uh, you know, going back more than 100 years. So there's a Yes, your point about the government taking education and just sort of saying, right, OK, this is the fixed point. But actually, there's a for me, there's a wider societal question about about what schools are for. And and I personally would really quite like um, teachers to have the opportunity to educate and not have such a wide range of responsibilities that connect to so many other things. Um, I can see there, yes, and an answer, a question from John, yes, what are they for, yes. And a great note from Rasheen about some of the teachers that she talked to about what they shared and and the, the experiences of colleagues and, and engaging with work and learning. Um, Rasheen. Last minute to you. Um, oh no, I don't want to take the last minute. It's just I just wanted to follow up on that that comment to Paul, um, just mm. because I think it is relevant to what he was raising. I think very um, very rightly about um, how do we engage people who aren't already engaged in these issues. And I do think that's something that came out very strongly in the work we did. There was a surprising amount of engagement, and that the teachers themselves were surprised by the interest shown by colleagues and how widely they could disseminate those ideas. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I just wanted to flag that. A really great point to end on and lots of the points that have actually come through in the discussion today connect to wider questions about about education about schools um, but in particular I suppose for those of us directly involved in in the, the provision of courses and working directly with either aspiring teachers or practicing teachers about that that space and the, the opportunity to recognise unknowings and, and learn together. So it's 17.30 folks, thank you so much. Um, I do think Nicola, we perhaps needed a little longer for, for debate, um, particularly in these last couple of seminars. So thank you everyone for attending um, and, and listening to the, the work that we have to share and also taking part in the discussion. Thank you folks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Morag. Um, pleasure to host the Attainment Challenge project um, with, through Cedar Connects and happy maybe to do a follow up um, late in the year or sometime in early next year, Morag. I think that would be good and perhaps create more of a space for discussion around that. That's a great opportunity. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll get set, something set up. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your evenings. Bye, thank you. Thanks, Morag. Just, I just waited to say thank you, Nicola. That's been super, um, and quite rich really that that, yeah. that that discussion and the one in the last one was actually there were both discussions that could have carried on for quite some time so um something this to think about really good yeah have a think about what you want to do um there's there's different things that we're trying now I, I'm, I'm meeting with Aileen about the teacher education network and we're talking about maybe having little kind of videos that short five ten minutes people watch before and then come along to a session for a discussion and um, so uh so that you can have more discussion in a